Oscar Miner, uh, when presenting to council tonight, if you could be brief, make sure you sign in on if you're speaking as a member of the public, and we can go from there. First up will be current planning. Thank you, Your Worship, and members of council. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Your Worship, and members of council. On December 6, 2018, administration received a development permit to allow the continued operation of a secondary suite within an accessory building. The subject property is located in the northwest annexation lands at the corner of Township Road 244 and Township Road 510. The site is currently Districted Direct Control District DC004. A secondary suite within an accessory building was previously approved by Leduc County in June 23, 2000, uh, sorry, and expired on June 23, 2014. Within Direct Control District, District DC004, a secondary suite within an accessory building is a permitted use. During the review process, administration noted the actual extent of the existing secondary suite exceeded the maximum floor area that allowed that was allowed within that district and a variance was required. The maximum floor area within the district for a secondary suite is 78 meters squared. This proposal um, includes 132 square meters. The land use bylaw provides that a development officer shall act as a development authority to make decisions on any direct control unless a variance is required. If a variance is required, that uh, then it is to be referred to council. Any Decision that council makes, they are not appealable to the subdivision and development appeal board. Since a variance is being requested in a direct control district, the city of Beaumont's development officer does not have jurisdiction to make a decision on a permit application. And this has been submitted to council for a decision. <coughs> within the site design, um, the site location is located within the second Elon neighborhood structure plan which is not anticipated to be developed until the first neighborhood in Elan is built out. And we're just beginning the construction of phase one right now. Ex access to the development exists off Range Road 244 and there's no additional um, access ne uh, needed for this proposed development. There's no traffic impact to the neighboring properties as there's minimal additional traffic flow entering and exiting the property. There are several parking lots um, that are existing in front of the accessory building and will be um, uh, and it will be sufficient for tenant parking. There is an existing RV storage site which does bring seasonal traffic but we don't believe that this proposed development will impose. Dust suppression activity on Range Road 244 was a condition of the development permit for the RV storage and will be implemented twice annually. Included within your package, you will have uh, um, development permit conditions that uh, in attachment two that contain standard permit conditions common to any development permit application and the condition for a variance. Further to these conditions, administration is recommending that there be a additional uh, building permit for the accessory building um, and that it is required within 14 days of the approval date of this permit for the applicant to apply for one. Recommend, we are um, also recommending approval with no limitation on length of time as a permit has little impact on current and future development. We circulate, administration circulated this application to Leduc County and adjacent landowners who, who um, with no objection. Administration requests that council approve development permit 2018 dash 643 for a secondary dwelling within an accessory secondary suite dwelling within an accessory building with the development permits conditioned as attached this concludes my presentation and if you have any questions i'd be happy to help answer them thank you very much really appreciate your presentation to council tonight are there questions from members of council well, okay. Councilor thank you in. Hit that five times. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Just a, a really quick question. Um, condition four about the 14-day approval, um, a building permit for the accessory building is required and within 14 days. Um, I haven't filled out one of these building permits myself. 
speak to, I'd hate for it to go through and why do we choose 14 days in our, to, to get that done? I'd hate for that to be the reason why this whole thing is held up and have to come back to us. Through your worship, through um, Councillor Monkoff Swain. Um, so this is an accessory, or this is an existing secondary suite in a, in a development that had a building permit um, applied for, but a final inspection was never done. There's tenants living there, and we do have concerns that this may, um, there may be, if, if this development permit um, is approved tonight, that we do have some sort of timeline to hold the landowner accountable, as, and we stated 14 days, just because that's our standard, um, uh, Ms. Darje might add some more information to that. Thank you. I can I can add some further information to that. So um, the condition states that a building permit is required to be applied for. It doesn't say approved or finalized. So it's just that we give them two weeks to come in and apply for the permit. Um, and the reason for the timeline is we want to ensure that they're coming in to apply for the term it, it, the permit within a timely manner. As Ms. Kwasney indicated, there are tenants living there. So we don't want this to drag out any longer. Um, and if they don't apply within the 14 days, we then have enforcement um, because we have a stated condition in there and we can follow up with that then. Yeah, okay. I, I, would, I mean, not too concerned about the condition. It was more of, is that is 14 days reasonable? Um, 14 days is quite normal. Uh, thank you. To be able to come in and apply for it. Thank you. And so I guess further back to the... Continuing down the down the same path, if uh, did they, how did they get an occupancy permit without a final? That was determined through Leduc County. We didn't have anything to do with that, so they've been living there. Um, and so, if they've been granted an occupancy permit already, they have or haven't? They haven't. Oh, fine. I'm gonna leave it there because <laughs> it's going down a rabbit hole. Any further questions from members of council? Councilor Stout. Thank you, Worship. Through your Worship, to the presenters. Um, so, follow on from that is um, so, how did we discover that this was non compliant that you referred to during another inspection? Through your Worship, to Councillor. So, um, the applicant or the landowner was actually selling the property and they requested a compliance certificate be done on the property um, and it was noted that. Uh, this permit was expired and the applicant needed to come in to submit a new application. As the previous permit was issued under Leduc County and it expired in 2014, so there was some time in between. Um, and um, yeah, it, it uh, it's uh, with the review process, we noted that the secondary suite contained the main floor and the secondary suite. And in the original permit that Ladue County issued, it was only the main floor. So it wasn't the second uh, floor of that. So that's why it, it exceeds the maximum allowable uh, floor area. And that's why we were requesting a variance. Okay, thank you. Councilor Danlock. Sorry, my question was answered in the presenter's answer. Thank you. All right. Seeing no further questions from council. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, is there a member? Is there a member of the public here to speak on behalf of the applicant or their designate? No. Is there any other member in the audience wishing to address council on this matter this evening? No. All right. Do you guys wish to make a concluding statement or are we done? We're done. We have nothing further. Nothing yeah. further. All right. The hearing is now closed. Which leads us to request for decision. Is there a member of council? Sorry. Is there a member of council prepared to move that council approve development permit 2018-643 for a secondary suite developing within, I'm not going to read it all, but is there any is there a member of council willing to move? Councillor Montgomery. Swain. Yeah, I'll move that motion, Your Worship. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Uh, okay. That carries unanimously. 
Thank you very much. <coughs> Which brings us to item 7A, uh, registered presentation from the violent threat risk assessment from the Ladukan area. Welcome to council. Worship, members of council, good evening. Uh, I just wanted to give an update on our Leducan Area Violence Threat Risk Assessment Team. Um, basically what it is, is um, some background on um, how it came to be. So school boards serving the communities in Leduc County in the area um, sought a proactive and effective response to threats of violence in schools. Um, some training and methodology from the Canadian Center for Threat Assessment and Trauma Response um, offers a violence threat risk assessment model. So it's something they've uh, developed that uh, we decided to adopt. Uh, the partners have formalized the relationship through the signing of the violence threat uh, risk assessment protocol. A um, little bit of background on that, it's now the North American Center for uh, Threat Assessment and Trauma Response. Um, basically kind of came out of um, a lead trainer called Kevin Cameron. He um, you know, responding to actually um, the um, attacks on high schools in uh, the Columbine uh, shooting as well as in Tabor, Alberta. So um, extensive background there. <clears throat> Our partners that are signed on right now are the Black Gold Regional School Division, uh, Evergreen Catholic Separate Regional School Division, St. Thomas Aquinas Roman Catholic School Division. Uh, Human Services, Children's Services are some community partners. They're actually not signed on to the protocol. Uh, Alberta Health Services, RCMP, and then Family Community Support Services. Um, so what is it? Basically, when um, the protocol brings together those partners to assess um, were recent behavior, threats, and acts of violence in schools. Um, it is not explicitly uh, school-based or not kind of beholden to that, but it, it, most of the, um, you know, the work there happens, does happen from the school. Um, it uses a data-driven analysis uh, in the context of a proactive approach. So um, before necessarily a school, a school needs to call 911, um, there's already a lot of pieces in place to surround uh, an individual or an incident uh, to kind of um, evaluate the risk and what the danger is and how, um, you know, how to proceed from there. Uh, it's legislatively protected, so um, it's compliant with FOIP, uh, HIA, PIPA, and, and basically um, how that works is all of that um, right through the Children First Act um, allows all those partners to share information and, and kind of talk freely and establish the best course of action uh, for that kid. So when is a VITRA called? Um, if the following behavior is observed, it should be reported to a school or partners, um, their VITRA lead, who will then kind of make the call, will activate the protocol for the initial response. Um, so serious violence, verbal written threats, uh, use of technology to communicate threats, possession of weapons or replicas, bomb threats, fire setting, sexual intimidation or assaults, uh, ongoing issues with harassment, gang-related intimidation or violence, or hate incidents. Uh, so in, there's kind of two levels to a VITRA, in level one, um, the safety of those involved are um, confirmed. An initial assessment kind of takes place. Um, if anyone is believed to be in immediate danger, 911 is called first. So it's something that needs that immediate response. It's not like everyone's sitting around and talking first. Uh, 911 is called if need be. Um, and looks at kind of the initial and past uh, threat maker behavior, some of their peer dynamics, uh, family dynamics, things like that. Um, and a further intervention or integration with community partners. There's maybe some more support, some bigger things going on there um, is needed. Then it moves uh, into what's called level two, uh, where further community partners kind of come in, come around the table. Um, so the benefits, proactive and collaborative. Um, it increases, you know, awareness of the situation, uh, what's going on with a particular individual, with a, um, you know, within a school system or that kind of thing. Um, you know, the, the response is just much, uh, much better, more cohesive, uh, common methods. So all the partners around the table are speaking the same language when we're working with this kind of thing. Uh, critical information sharing. So, um, you know, no stones really left unturned, right? When we're dealing with a kid and how this kid, um, you know, is, 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 um, you know, just what's going on with them. You know, we're talking to parents, family, peers, any sort of community partner that might have a role with them, that kind of thing. Uh, clarifies the partner roles, so everyone has a pretty clear role around the Vitra table. 
um, in order to make sure that um, no one's, you know, overstepping any boundaries or that kind of thing or no duplication of services. Uh, it's a proven platform. So it's it's been used um, quite well received, uh, you know, North America wide now. <clears throat> Just some numbers for Beaumont. So since 2016, uh, we have 15 recorded Vitra activations in Beaumont. Um, out of those 15, eight were considered low to medium risk situations and seven considered medium to high. Uh, out of those 15, five involved the threat, presence, or reference to a weapon. That's about it. Yeah. <laughs> in a nutshell. In a nutshell. In a nutshell, short and sweet. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, maybe I'm a little dense, but what exactly is the protocol? Like, is, is it a checklist or something that they can go through? Or? There is a step-by-step -step protocol. So every school has uh, a package that they're given. Every school goes through a training program. It's four days of intensive training with Kevin Cameron or the Vitra trainers. Um, and it's in uh, Vitro 1, it's an information gathering. So basically there is a set of protocols, the questions that need to be asked about the situation, the viability of the risk, uh, whether extra steps need to be taken. Even at that first step, often the partners come in for a level 2 Vitro, but even in the first stage, we could have partners, we might have a connection with mental health if we already know that a student is involved with mental health or we might already have RCMP um, or FCSS involved if we know that they already have involvement there. So uh, even in a stage one, it's information gathering and it's really the assessment of the risk itself and whether there is a credible risk and if there is uh, the beginning steps of what needs to happen. Vitra 2 is often laying out a long-term plan so that we're getting in front of any future risks as well. So often that might lead to a student getting access to mental health services, whereas they might not have been uh, accessing them beforehand. Or they're getting access um, to FCSS, or the family is getting help and support, mm -hmm. if that is one of the um, mitigating factors involved. Excellent, thank you very much. Councillor Danlock, question? Thank you, Worship. Thank you, your presentation. Just uh, two quick questions. Um, how is the protocol activated? Is that at the administration level or do the, or do the teachers know themselves when to activate the protocol or is it the teacher goes to the principal or VP and say, we have a Vitra protocol issue and how does it work in the school? I'm kind of curious about that. Um, it can be activated uh, in a lot of different ways. Often it is a, a teacher, sometimes it's even a student who okay. comes forward, sometimes a parent who comes forward with a, a, a threat for instance, right. uh, usually goes to school administration, and school administration then would call student services, Black Gold Student Services, uh, for this district anyway, they called student services. Uh, the head of our student services department then would enact the protocol, as in the tree of which individuals would come out to the school to support the process. Okay, a follow-up question, if you don't mind, Your Worship, sure. thank you. Uh, it's a two-part question, actually. <laughs> How are you funded? And I'm assuming the partners have a role in the funding of the program. And how is the program promoted in the schools? Like how would a, you mentioned a parent may activate a student. How would a parent or student know about this program? Um, parents or students don't necessarily know the terminology or what it is, but schools have been handling these kinds of threats forever. So it's just to take something that's already been happening and then put a framework around it. Um, I don't know if we've been, been doing any parent nights, et cetera. I know in Leduc they've done um, signing presentations, they've publicized it, and members of the public can come in, and there's usually a bit more description and discussion of the program and protocols, so when they did their signing agreement four or five years ago. Um, other than that, it's not really, um, I wouldn't say it's something that's out there. Schools are all trained in it, but it's not necessarily out in the public. Funding comes through the Black Gold Schools, um, health, so AHS and mental health in particular. Uh, RCMP provides their own people. Um, sometimes it's our SROs, which are partially funded by the school board and the school district, partially funded by communities. Um, 
uh, FCSS, they have, they provide their people. Mm -hmm. So most of the organizations that are involved are paying for their own people who come to be involved with us. But RCSD, which is a reason, regional collaborative services, um, is one of the things that oversees it all. And they have a pocket of funding that comes from both education and from health. Councillor Van Uger. Well, thank you, Three Your Worship, to the presenter. Uh, thanks for coming in tonight and sharing about this. A uh, question around um, number of trained individuals per school. Is there a suggested best practice or a ratio, or is it just more the better? Um, all administrators are requested to yeah. do the training. So at the very least, every principal is trained. Often their assistants are also trained. The counselors in schools are also trained um, to be part of this. So it's usually those individuals. So in a larger school, say Beau Beaumont Composite, would have a principal, uh, is it three or four assistant principals? Three, three assistant principals and uh, two counselors who would all have received the training. Thank you. Councillor Barnard. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you very much for the presentation. A lot of the questions that I had have been answered, and uh, I am somewhat familiar with the program, so uh, looking forward to updates. My question is around provincial stats. So seeing the numbers here, these are from 2016. I was just wondering if we have any update on the information, and how does this compare to other places across the province? Do we know? I, just to clarify, this is since 2016. Um, so that's 2016 Thank on you. for I saw the one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure provincially um, how that gets rolled out. To be honest, uh, maybe Joyce knows. But, um, yeah, well, it's not. Uh, Vitra is not province wide. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Edmonton Public does not do Vitra. So it's pretty hard to do uh, a comparison. Mm -hmm. um, we know in Black Gold we've been involved with Vitra since a year after Tabor is when we did our first feature training. It wasn't called it back then. Mm -hmm. It's become that since then. Uh, so we're, we're just ahead of it. Do we're you feel like we're, this is a, well, of course, no, zero would be the rest of the right number. <laughs> Are we making it, have you seen it go up by year? If this was since 2016, have you been tracking it? Well, one of the interesting things about Vitra is, it, in fact, sometimes you'll get more Vitra requests as people get used to the idea of doing mm -hmm. the investigation. So whereas uh, previously a threat may be, you know, may be heard by one person and considered low level and it never went any further. Mm -hmm. Now with the training that people are receiving is they know uh, what needs to be reported. And so in fact, we probably have more reports of threats now than we did before we adopted the protocol. But the idea is it's a proactive strategy. Mm -hmm. This is to prevent violent incidents from happening. It's to get ahead of them at the threat stage so that the actual um, violent episode is not being perpetrated on others. Thank you for that. Councillor Danlock, follow up. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. One last quick question. If a school has a, a lockdown situation, does that protocol fund under this program or is that a separate protocol they follow? Just, just That's curious. That's the hour zero protocol. They're all linked in some way I because it may be. be a vitra that's being called and there's a viable threat, so they call a lockdown okay. in the school in order to, uh, while they're dealing with the threat. So when I was at Leduc Composite, that happened a few times. We might have a hold and secure while they were investigating a threat that was found in the cafeteria. Okay. So mm -hmm. those kind of things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming in tonight. It was... Uh, Highly educational. I didn't really know much about this until tonight. So thank you very much for answering all our questions, and we really, really appreciate your, appreciate your coming in. And uh, anything we can do to help in the future, let us know. Okay. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you very much. Brings us to business item eight A: draft arts policy approval. Mr. Hills. Thank you, Your Worship, Member of Council. Um, tonight we bring before you approval for the draft arts policy. Um, this was last before Council at the Committee of the Whole of February 19th. I was, and we were asked to bring it back um, to Council for March 12th for approval and to work with the Beaumont Society for the Arts on our terms of reference. 
And uh, basically from, from that uh, perspective, the policy uh, is basically the same policy that you would have um, seen on the committee of the whole meeting. Any changes to the policy have been in red. We did change consultation to collaboration on item 6.11. We added 6.42, a little bit of clarification on funding, and on 6.6, .6, artistic freedom, uh, freedom and media awareness, we added the word affirms. And those are the, basically the changes that we've had in the last time this uh, policy has been in front of council. As part of the direction from uh, elected officials on the, at the committee of the whole meeting, we were to look at some potential um, dates and to look at a process for working together on a draft committee uh, terms of reference. So reaching out to the Beaumont Society of the Arts, they suggested some dates in May. So we were looking at uh, May 8th and May 16th um, to work with members of the Beaumont Society of the Art and we would be um, asking council to also consider and approve three members of council to sit on that committee and we're either looking at one or two meetings to, uh, to go through a facilitated process. So tonight before you we're looking at the council approve the attached draft Beaumont Arts Policy Development and Practice of Artistic and Cultural Expression Policy the council appoint three council members to work with the Beaumont Society for the Arts on the terms of reference that council direct administration to bring back the terms of reference for approval once complete. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Hiltz, for the presentation tonight. And just before we get going, I'd like to say thank you to the members of the Beaumont Society of the Arts for bearing with us. It's been a bit of a process, but, I, but we're finally here after the last committee of the whole meeting. I can confidently say we're, we're everybody's on the same page and moving forward. I'd like to say thank you to the members of council for uh, going through this process to make sure we got it right and not quickly and looking forward to hopefully approving this tonight and, and, and moving forward. Is there a member of council willing to move approval of the draft arts policy? Councillor Stout. Thank you, Worship. Yes, I'd like to move that council approve the draft, the Beaumont draft arts policy as presented. Appreciate that. Thank you. Is there discussion on the motion? Seeing none. All in favor? And that carries unanimously. You can cheer now. This has been a process. <laughs> you can cheer now. This has been a process. Um, yeah. On to, the, on to the next one that might be a little more difficult. That council appoint three council members to work with the Bowen Society of the Arts. I did do a little straw poll, so we're going to have to have a discussion because I think everybody wants to be involved. Um, so we do have to limit it to three, otherwise it turns into a council meeting and that's quorum and that's just bad. Because I know I'd like to be on it and I know everybody else would be on it, so open up the discussion for people who'd like to be on. So, Councillor Moncott Swain. Yeah, I, I just, you asked me, I said yes, uh, but if other people want to do it, I'm more than happy to let them do it if it comes back here, so I can, I can withdraw my name. Um, but I did want to say... Um, just to reiterate and the thank you to the, the folks here who grinded away through this long time coming, um, but uh, sets us up well for for a future of the city here, so that's great. So I'll pull my name out. Thank you. Councillor Van Newkirk. Yeah, thank you. Um, the two dates were, that were floated were the 8th and the 16th, I believe you said? Yeah. Um, there is a conflict for councillors on the 8th if uh, the state of the city for Edmonton is that day. Um, I know I've signed up. I don't know if other councillors have, so there would be a conflict on that day for those who have signed up. Uh, well, we do have the, the 16th, and we can probably look at another uh, date. Um, we got in probably four or five different dates, but working with the facilitator, we had to kind of narrow it down. So we probably can go back and see if there's another another one there, but we'd be looking at the 16th then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to take part in that uh, process. I'd put my name forward just so long as... I guess the eighth has changed. I've already signed up for that event, so. It depends. Are we envisioning these are to be all-day events or just part of the day? Three hours. Three hours? Okay. We may actually so be an able afternoon to do might work yeah. then. Yeah. yeah. I know Councillor Danluck. Thank you, Worship. I also volunteered, I guess, uh, to serve in the committee if, uh, if so desired by council. Thank you. But also there's a lot of people who want to serve, so almost too many people want you to serve, which is not a bad thing, a situation to have, I guess, so. We can figure it out. Sir, so, so are you in or out? I'm in. 
in if needed. Councillor Stoke. Thank you, Worship. Yes, I'm, I'm in as well, and I want to add my thanks to Belmont Society of the Arts for doing this, the work on this and, and to Mr. Hiltz for facilitating and reaching the necessary compromises. At, w at one point, you were a member of the board of that organization. Are you still a member of the board of that organization? I am not currently a member of the board of that organization, no. Okay. Councillor Barnhart. Thank you, Worship. And uh, as much as I want to be part of this and did say I would be, I'm going to withdraw my name for reason that there's plenty of people that are competent and able to do it. But the second reason is that I have another meeting on the 16th. So, oh. and, and I can go to the State of the City address if, that's, uh, if Council wants that. So Fair enough. You can take my name off that, and I know it's in good hands. I'm not worried about that. Okay, so we're, we're down to four. Myself, Councillors Van Newkirk, Dan Luck, and Stout. Is there anybody that wants to withdraw, or are we having a vote? <laughs> 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 How would we resolve this? Arm wrestle. <laughs> I was looking for right. <laughs> That's why I jumped out. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like Steve's in. <laughs> looks, like, looks like Steve's in. I was going to suggest a poking Council Dan, look. Uh, thank you, Worship. This is a rather unique problem, and I'm glad the arts people are to hear how excited we are to just serve on the committee. I think it's great that we've got four people who want to serve. I might suggest that we are having a meeting on Saturday. Perhaps we could agree to appoint three people tonight, in which three will be determined by we can like, check each other's schedules to make sure we're okay rather than trying to figure out right now. Would that work? Just say we're going to get three people. We've got four already. We'll have three for sure. Which three will be determined yet, or we have to decide tonight? Well, I'd rather decide tonight. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm just suggesting. Because eventually we have to to come and do a motion, so. Okay, well, I'm in. You're in. <laughs> so should we draw? Right. <laughs> That's some ballot. we draw? <laughs> See you. Well, I'm, I'm gonna put the pressure squarely on the chair of the meeting to, to make the decision, so. <laughs> nice job, nice try on the straws, though. We okay. Many straws. Is everybody okay if I just pick the three? Okay, so. Sorry, Bill. Is this the hardest thing you guys to do? <laughs> yeah. That's one of I'm going to pick myself because I'm going to pick myself. Uh, myself, Councillor Van Newkirk, and Councillor Stout because Bill did say he would opt out if nobody else wanted to. So if everybody's okay with that, I'm going to make that motion. You're fine. And we'll carry you as an alternate just in case we can't. Sure. Can't go. So I'll make that motion that myself, Councillor Van Newkirk, Councillor Stout be appointed to the Terms of Reference Committee. All in favor? That carries unanimously. And I'll make the motion that administration bring back the terms of reference for approval once the process is complete. Discussion on the motion? All in favor? Oops, sorry. Councilor Mogaswe. Thank you, Worship. Um, so I'm glad that this is the process we're going down. I appreciate um, being flexible here. Um, so I just wanted to get an understanding of the final approval piece. The last thing I want to do is have three people from council and the Arts Society go away and work and come up with some, the terms of reference and then us get up here and debate it again and go down this thing for another two or three months. So I appreciate it's in front of us for approval. Um, what is the, the, the process for that? So the terms of reference will be developed then they'll be shared or will come to a council meeting uh, and then there'll be debate debate and a vote that night. Is that? That would be the intent, correct? Is that it would be um, shared amongst the, the three members of council as representatives of, of the council as a whole would go when they would um, go through a facilitated process with the Beaumont Society of the Arts in the terms of reference. That terms of reference would come back to um, council. Um, if council at that uh, meeting chooses not to uh, move forward with it and with, with suggested changes or something, then that's basically the process that we would, that we would go with. So, I am hoping it would come back to a committee of the whole for discussion because it should go back to the BSA board members as well for their approval mm -hmm. and their discussion because yeah, I'm cause assuming they're not going to put 12 people on this committee, but yeah. I could be wrong. No, it would be the same. Uh, they would have the same representation as council. Right. So maybe I'll ask a different question. Mm -hmm. What's us? So we've got three people appointed for council. Mm -hmm. Does it, I guess, does it need to come back for approval? Can we, we've got a facilitated 
person there that is going to mm -hmm. help get us to a point yeah. there. We've got three members of council here that we've um, shown a lot of faith in tonight. Um, can we not just go away and um, council works together and then um, the through the facilitation comes up with the final recommendation and approval? I, I just, I, I just, I don't want us to get back here and, and, and you know, delay this even even longer where we're, we're nearly there. Yeah. Well, if it would make, um, through, through your worship and to members of council, if it make council more comfortable, it can come back to a committee of the whole for discussion. But a terms of reference should actually come back to council for approval. Like that was something that it should actually have that okay. foundation to it. It should be approved by council if they're going to be and they're comfortable with, with it moving forward. It would be no different than the Beaumont Community Center Advisory Committee's in terms of reference, the forthcoming uh, Beaumont uh, Sport and Rec Committee in terms of reference and things. Okay. So you do want to have that as a, as a guiding principle. Um, but it's it's a question, you know, at that point, we would hope that it's gone through this. There's a very little, I think, in terms of debate and stuff, we're kind of hoping that it will be a very smooth process. Okay, I'm good to support the motion. Thank you. Further discussion on the motion? All in favor. And that carries unanimously. Which brings us to item 8B, strategic economic development. Mr. Rob Mackin. I guess that's one way to create the room. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. It's uh, exciting to be here in front of you tonight to present uh, an economic development strategic innovation program. So as uh, the founder of Bill Gates noted, organizations pursuing economic prosperity require innovation to do so. This project in front of you will put Beaumont on the map as a community that supports and fosters innovation. And some economic reports have stated that for every $1 spent on innovation, there's upwards of $4 of new tax growth. Our 2018 economic development framework delivered as part of the Sontraville project outlined key objectives that were intended to help expand and attract new investment to Beaumont, as well as increase our overall presence in the region and abroad. A key strategic objective from this report specifically highlighted an opportunity for Beaumont to explore emerging sectors such as advanced technology and the commercialization, test, te commercialization testing as an opportunity for new investment and traction. So we have now been presented with an opportunity to partner on a first of its kind project in Canada and possibly further abroad to be the test site for autonomous transit in a mixed traffic setting. We are working with Pacific Western Transportation, the largest privately owned people transportation company in Canada, to pr provide this program to Beaumont for a six month period from April through to September, with anticipated benefits and spin-offs to be recognized for a considerably longer time thereafter. We believe this initiative will be a calling card for Beaumont. It'll showcase our community across Canada and abroad that we are open for business. We are not a bedroom community. Beaumont will be the first community in Canada to integrate these technologies in a community setting and a community that is open to partnering with innovators in advancing and commercializing other new technologies. So this program isn't just for the six month period. We are looking at leveraging this opportunity for many other benefits to the community, including the possible co-hosting of an international conference, which would take place at Edmonton International Airport in the fall. We're also building out a potential PR and marketing campaign that will draw international and national coverage to our community. And at the local level, we are also working with local businesses, if this project is proved, to ensure that their businesses are benefiting every day that it's just going on. Also, from a community planning perspective, longer term knowledge gained from this project will support our own, the provincial and national strategies around public transit, the future of autonomous transportation and community design. This program really builds upon our value proposition as a community of choice, not only for residents, but what we believe in economic development for business investment and investment of innovation. We see considerably new interest in Beaumont's from an office development, from the development of our business parks and our industrial lands, 
And we believe that by targeting innovative sectors, we can differentiate our community from others across the region. Our young educated population base combined with our strategic location makes us an ideal setting for these sectors. Next steps, if this is approved tonight, will be to advance the strategic economic development program, finalizing our partnership details with PWT, continuing dialogue with a number of other external stakeholders, and finalizing preparations for this pilot. External stakeholders also include Transport Canada and Alberta Transport, who have been key in working with us along the way. We also will be planning and building out a marketing, social media, and a public relations campaign, a local business program that will allow local businesses not only partner with this initiative, but benefit through increased traffic during and after, such as cross-promotional opportunities. We will be building a community engagement plan that will build community excitement in Beaumont, but across the region through working with local schools, post-secondary institutions, and other groups. We also are advancing discussions with potential sponsors and partners. This program is leading edge in nature, and we're actively working with a number of interested partners who want to be part of this six-month pilot in Beaumont. Sponsorship dollars and partnership activities will go to offset our internal and external costs associated with this program. So tonight, Council, I have uh, three options in front of you. One is that we approve the funding of the Strategic Economic Development Innovation Program for a maximum of $200,000 to be funded from our mill rate stabilization fund. The Council refuse the funding for this program and the $200,000 from the fund. Or option three, that we defer the Economic Development Innovation Program and have administration further review it for recommendation. I'm open to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Mack. I really appreciate it. It's it's an exciting project coming to Beaumont, and uh, uh, looking forward to to seeing it spin off. Is there a member of council willing to move option one? Councilor Montgomery, I'll uh, happily move option one. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Uh, is there a discussion on the motion? Yeah. Firstly, um, just a general comment. Uh, you know, this new council came in here, and I think we gave yourselves a, a mandate to do something different. Um, we got to we got to work on that 95.5 um, tax um, concern that we have in our community, uh, and this is certainly that. And so I want to um, you know express my sincere gratitude to you guys for going out there. There's been a lot of work. Uh, these things don't just happen by making a phone call and asking, right? There's a lot of work that goes into it. Uh, so I just wanted to really thank administration for everything you've done to, to get us here. This is incredibly exciting. Um, I, I do have a question for you, um, but I did just want to acknowledge that. Um, you talked about, uh, you referred to it as uh, the f testing autonomous transit in a mixed traffic setting. So I know what that is, uh, only because I've seen the documents. Can you just speak to that in plain language so that folks either in the room or listening in understand what you mean? Um, as much as you can say at this point, um, for sure. just to try and give people a better idea of what we're actually talking about here. Thank you for the uh, question, Councillor Monkoff Swain. Uh, what we're talking about here is the first of its kind testing of an autonomous vehicle, a uh, public transit vehicle, on an actual roadway where there's going to be interfacing with traffic signals, pedestrian crosswalks, and some of the other rules of the road that you may find. Uh, details about that will be part of the, the rollout of this so that the community can be engaged and informed throughout it, but uh, I hope that answers your question at a high level. Yeah, and, and the, the follow-up question is, um, you know, today's March 12th, April's not <laughs> that far away, um, so we're confident that we can pull everything together to get, the, to get this ready for April, I yes. assume. Yes, we, uh, we have great synergies going on internally within our organization, with our partners, as well as with the other regulatory bodies. And I, and I do, if I may, Councillor Monkoff Swain and Council, this, this is the first of its kind, and we're taking this as an opportunity to really showcase Beaumont as open to this testing. So over the six-month period, we're going to be able to learn, adapt, and grow from this, not only as a community, but uh, further abroad. Yeah, thank you. And th that's the key word I wanted to highlight, is testing. Um, this isn't you know, th this is the first of its kind, as you mentioned here, right? So, you know, we're going to be working through that and the benefits that come off with that. Um, but testing is the key word here. This isn't going to be perfect, and we're going to work through this as a community together. So thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Barnhart. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Worship, and thank you very much. 
Mr. Mackin, this has obviously taken a long time to get us to this point, and you've worked really hard. Actually, it took a short time to get us very far, so appreciate all the work that's gone into this. My question is just around the, the naming of this program. Mm -hmm. um, it, this is the major project within the program. Do you anticipate other projects, or is this basically budgeted for this one project, which is the autonomous vehicle? So uh, thank you for the question, Councilor Barnhart. This right now is targeted towards this specific element, but we are reaching abroad to figure out if there's other technology innovation programs that could be related that we can dovetail and maximize this opportunity. But right now, this is specific to this one, um, but we are, through our conversations, believe this will open up many other doors. Uh, but at this time, we want to keep this uh, a straightforward ask of council and the community, but we are exploring other options that we can hopefully leverage. If I could just ask a, a follow-up then, mm -hmm. and this might be a question for, for the administration, for Mr. Harris. In the stabilization fund right now, so mm -hmm. this would take $200,000 out of it, what's left in there? What's the amount that's in the fund right now? Do you know? I will let uh, Mr. Harris speak to what is left, but I did want to also confirm that uh, through the sponsorship dollars, we plan to offset that. That is the, the cap. So, yeah. Roughly speaking, it doesn't have to be exact. I just would like to have a sense of it. Mr. Harris? He's talking in the mic. Sorry, I was just getting confused with a light versus a microphone. Um, it's money yeah, it's the money guy. Yeah. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, I believe that depending on the 2018 year end, it, it leaves us uh, 800,000 left in the mill rate stabilization fund. Be before just this? Off. Well, the, after this. After this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Councilor Van Newkirk. Yeah, thank you. Um, I won't repeat what's been already said, but uh, a lot of hard work has went in to get to this spot and just have to reiterate that there's a lot of places in Canada that could have been chosen for this and uh, the conversations that the administration team has had um, have brought this here and I think that's special and I think we should be proud of that. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Stout. Thank you, Worship. Um, just wanted to comment that very much in favour of the motion. I won't repeat what Everybody else has already said. Um, what I just wanted to highlight the quote there from Bill Gates that uh, uh, Mr. Mackin has already um, stated organizations pursuing economic prosperity require innovation to do so. For me, that's right on the button. Um, we can't keep doing the same things and expecting a different result, which means we have to innovate, we have to change things. Innovation and change bring some risk, and I think there are risks involved with this for sure. Um, but if we if we want to improve or we want anything to get any better, then we have to face we have to manage and face those risks. And um, I'm very much in favour of doing this in a, in a managed and controlled manner, as has been proposed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Danlock. Thank you, Worship. I will take two seconds. Just say, great work. I mean, innovation was mentioned in my previous council's council's comments, and we have to be different, we have to be innovative, and this is putting us on the map. It really is. It's fantastic. And just for the point of order, or not point of order, just a point of clarification that using the real stabilization fund does not increase property taxes. So anybody's listening in the audience at home or in the room here, this is done. It's not going to affect our property tax base. No one's going to pay any more for it. It's already looked after from our from our reserve. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. All right. Seeing no further. Further questions or comments from council, and I'll be honest, I don't see any further need to weigh in on it because everything that I wanted to say has already been said. I will call the vote. All in favor? That carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Mr. Mackin. Which brings us to bylaw 9A, bylaw 937 19, smoke free public places for second and third reading. Mr. Cook. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Your Worship. Good evening, uh, Your Worship, members of council. It's a pleasure to be here with you again on this beautiful spring evening. Uh, administration is before you this evening seeking uh, second and third readings for bylaw number 937-19, the smoke-free public places bylaw. This bylaw has received first reading, and that was uh, done here just a little over a month ago. 
Uh, just as a, as a bit of insight to on September 25th, Council directed administration to return with an updated smoke-free public places bylaw that aligned with Beaumont's new cannabis consumption bylaw. Uh, supporting this direction at the time, 72.6% uh, of residents supported aligning smoking tobacco with cannabis when they were polled during an online cannabis consumption survey that was conducted in the fall of 2018. As mentioned, this bylaw has received first reading and it has been reviewed by legal. As required by the Municipal Government Act, bylaw 937-19 has been advertised on the city's website, social media outlets, and of course in the Beaumont newspaper. As requested by Council, public consultation was conducted on February 23rd, 2019, where administration engaged over 20 residents with only one speaking out against the bylaw. And one of our targets or goals during that public consultation was to target individuals who were smokers. So we kept an eye on the door and anytime anyone left the building to have a cigarette six meters away from the front door, we got them as they came in. No feedback was received through online avenues during this time. In addition, and as a part of this process, administration has also reviewed similar sized municipalities, so mid-sized cities throughout Alberta, and found that approximately 50% of these cities reviewed uh, that we reviewed do provide an exception for businesses for the testing purposes or demonstrating purposes of smoking paraphernalia, so an e-cigarette, for example. Of course, any, businesses, any business provided such an exception would be required to obtain a permit through their municipality and, of course, meet the intent of the Alberta Building Code. Uh, just a quick touch on the Alberta Building Code. Uh, vaping is, a pro is considered by the Alberta Building Code a product of combustion. Uh, Alberta Building Code Article 6.2.2.5 6 uh, states that air contaminants must be removed at their point of origin. And of course, this is to limit the spread of contamination throughout the building. Not wanting to get into too much detail again, as there is some interest in this area. However, there are exceptions uh, throughout the province that have been provided in this area. Again, the Alberta Building Codes or the intent would need to be met. Uh, having said that, I'd be interested or happy to entertain any questions the Council may have. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or clarifying questions from the administration? Or is somebody prepared to move second reading? Councillor Van Newkirk. Oh. Have some extra flashing lights, is that okay? I don't know, but you're on. So. Okay, good, perfect. Um, yeah, thank you, Worship, through to the presenter. Uh, thanks for the, the work we've put into this to date. Um, I think there's a, a pretty big conversation in front of us, uh, you know, with the smoke-free smoke -free public places. And uh, the, as I understand, and I wasn't explaining the, the standard avenues of um, public feedback were sought after and uh, we did you know the same suite of public engagement that we've done in the past and uh, you know there were some people that came out to the um, to the open house I, I attended uh, I believe Councillor Monkoff Swain attended as well and we did see some engagement and, and that such uh, for myself though um, I I wouldn't and, and won't be prepared to support second or third reading tonight uh, I really do feel that uh, we should go back to the community and get some further engagement I feel that if we were to proceed with uh, this conversation tonight and have an outcome uh, presented, that it would be a big surprise to the community. Uh, just as I as I polled people and uh, spoke with spoke with folks ad hoc in the last week or so, there was not a whole bunch of awareness around the fact that we were looking at having this conversation and and making the decision. And yes, I understand that is despite the, the normal avenues. Um, I do feel that uh, yeah, that, that that's my thoughts. I feel that we should. Uh, pause and uh, do some more public feedback on this issue and then uh, revisit the conversation again. So that's that's where my head's at on it tonight. I wouldn't support a second or a third reading tonight. So, Okay. Comments from other members of council? Councillor Stout. Thank you, Worship. Um, I had I had a question I'd like to ask, um, and it's a hypothetical question. So, through your worship to the presenter, um, I'm looking at. Let's see if I can find the section in the current bylaw, uh, the proposed bylaw. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, I'm looking at section four, general provisions, four point one. Unless an exception applies under this bylaw, no person may engage in smoking. 
on the grounds of an outdoor public event, except in an area specifically reserved for smoking by the proprietor of the outdoor public event. Um, so my question really is, who determines whether or not that's allowed and what the, what the terms of, of that might be? So hypothetically, let's suppose I decide I'm going to have the Beaumont Cigar Smoking Festival in, uh, in a park somewhere in Beaumont, and I set it up outdoors, and it runs every weekend from May till September, and most of the area for the... Um, for this, most of the area of the event is also a designated is reserved for smoking. Um, that doesn't seem to me that I'd be really <clears throat> playing by the intent of the rules, but as outlined here. But again, I can't see anything that would prohibit it. Right. Would, could you comment on that? Uh, to Councillor Stout, uh, through your worship, uh, certainly. Um, with your with the hypothetical situation um any event that takes place within the city of beaumont goes through a permitting process that permit process uh, is either done online or in person and it's reviewed by a number of individuals or um, area representatives fire enforcement rcmp uh, operations for example that have an opportunity to re review each permit application uh, look at the impacts for which that specific event will cause or may cause uh, and we have the ability to comment and to adjust or put uh, restrictions, if you will, on that specific event. I would, I would uh, suggest that a, an application for such an event would go through the same process. It is rigorous. Um, and again, it is very encompassing of every department that has a stake in the game, so to speak, with regards to that event or what, what may come of it. Uh, following that, when we do look at various permits and such, we take into account all regulations. That includes fire code, building code, uh, various other provincial statutes, acts, and bylaws, of course, uh, to ensure that we are not breaking any rules and that we are meeting the intent or the obligation or uh, the intent and, and obligations of those various various acts. That would be the same case here. Um, so, in the event that we were being requested to host uh, a cigar smoking event in Beaumont, um, we would be looking at an area, uh, if approved, we'd be looking at an area that's very much removed, that meets all the requirements of our smoking bylaw, and of course, uh, at that time too, that they were had the ability or um, that the City of Beaumont had the opportunity to review, again, limiting any impacts beyond that event. If that, makes, if that answers your question? Uh, yes, thank you. I think it does. Um, so what I'm hearing is that that restriction is not really covered in the um, in this bylaw, but would be covered by a permitting process necessary to have the outdoor public event. Any outdoor public event is 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 done through a permit process, and I'm sorry the the exact bylaw or location where that's identified escapes me right now. Uh, it may be in our land use bylaw. However, it is a routine process we near daily uh, entertain. So scope for, and uh, my hypothetical case is, is deliberately to test where, where the limits of this would be. So scope for, for pushing beyond what was actually intended would be, would be, would be restricted by the granting of a permit. Of whether or not that permit was granted. It would be reviewed. Uh, restrictions would be put in place to ensure compliance. And uh, in addition, I, I should add to my previous comments, uh, not only is it reviewed by every uh, department head or every department that has an interest in it, it's also reviewed and signed off by the General Manager of Community and Protective Services as well. Which is who? Mr. Uh, Hiltz. Mr. Mr. Hiltz. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That, yeah, that covers the, what Sorry. I had. Thank you. Thank you very much. A uh, quick question for myself. Um, you mentioned, going back in the presentation, there was half of the municipalities present, uh, gave exceptions to allowing in businesses? Yes. Sorry, just refresh my memory. Um, do we have in this bylaw provision to be able to grant those types of permits? Um, I would suggest no, not today. I would, um, if we were going to look at that type of provision, I would want to bring the bylaw back um, after some research and get legal opinion on it to ensure that we're in compliance and that, as written, it would address that requirement. Okay, that answers my question. Councillor Danluck. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'd just like to perhaps explore 
uh, Councilor Van Newkirk's uh, concern about um, awareness uh, in the sense that, as you know, we have passed the cannabis bylaw late last year, and smoking bylaw is sort of geared towards putting those two in sync together. Have we done the same amount of public engagement that we did with the cannabis um, bylaw in terms of publication, open houses? Is there anything different in this round of uh, public awareness than we did with the cannabis? The reason I'm asking is uh, to explore Ms. Councilman Newkirk's concern before we go any, any further tonight and um, perhaps weigh some of his concerns on that or explore more in depthly. I did a conference with the Coffee of the Councilor back in the fall last year and advertised a talk about cannabis specifically and nobody showed up. It's my one time I got skunked from Nomenshore for coffee and it was about cannabis specifically and everyone seemed to be okay with it. So I'm curious if we've done the same amount of engagement for smoking bylaw as we have with the cannabis bylaw. It's my first question. Okay. If you could expand on that, please. Uh, certainly, uh, to Councillor Danilek, through your worship. Um, with the cannabis bylaw, we conducted two open houses. One was uh, uh, on a weekend, uh, just at uh, on the corner of 52nd and 50th Street, and another was in the Aquapit. Whereas with the smoking bylaw, we conducted one open house or one public consultation that was at the Ken Nichols Centre on a Saturday morning where we had a lot of foot traffic due to sporting events going on in, in, the, uh, in the facility. Further to that, uh, however, we were online as well with the smoking bylaw. We did not release a survey like we did with the cannabis consumption bylaw. Uh, however, at that time when we did release the cannabis consumption survey, we did ask the question, would residents like us, would residents like us to align smoking tobacco with cannabis, for which 72% did say yes. I'll hold my second question later, if you don't mind. Thank sure. you. Sure. Councillor Mungas. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, go, going back to, so maybe if you want to pull up page uh, 80 there, um, Ms. Winter. So going back to 4.3 where we say, a proprietor of a place where smoking is prohibited by this bylaw shall not permit any individual to smoke in that place. So you said this was 50%. Explain to me why a proprietor couldn't do that. We've got, we got an existing business that it's allowed right now and you know given the um given the way this is written what you just indicated is that now they would not be able to offer that um that optional that service to to customers coming into the why would we not do that so i think and i guess the the reason my question is i think the intent around this is is the concern around um you know learned behavior um that's certainly part of it around parks and schools and that, right? You don't want to see, so, but if it's in a store where, you know, you've got to be 18 to, to try and all that sort of stuff, why would we prohibit that? Certainly, uh, to Councillor Munkoff, Swain, through your worship, uh, just to address your first point, uh, allowing a business to, uh, to smoke or to test a product inside of a business, uh, I'm unaware of any that are permitted today uh, that meet the intent or the regulations of the Alberta Building Code that can do that. Uh, given the sensitivity of, 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 this, of the impacts of this proposed bylaw, uh, that is something we would be working with existing business owners to ensure that they are compliant with the Alberta Building Code. Um, but I, I need to make that clear that uh, administration was unaware of that until very recently. But again, we're wanting to work with our with our residents. Um, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the second? No, no. I, I think you, you answered you answered everything I needed. Okay. Um, I, I would, um, get, given your answer uh, and um, you know the the concern around you know um, some of the engagement that Councillor Van Newkirk has pointed out, um, I would support the. The option. I don't think there's any rush here for us to do this. I'd like to, I'd like um, for administration to go back and provide a bit more background around that uh, building code concern and where that is. And and I just think we would be rushing into that decision tonight. So uh, I would support um, where where Council Van Newkirk is going with this. So what I'm hearing is a motion for to defer back to admin to explore the building code thing, building code issue and to go back for further consultation. Is that the motion you're prepared to make? Or Councillor Van Newkirk? Yeah, yeah. The... Oh, I'm like, what? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. Response option number five. Yeah. Is, that, is that the motion? I'm just pulling up number five. Sorry, I had my other sheet open here. I, 
I think we just defer yeah. it back for you yeah, know those so two I items. Think, I think a little more public. The, yeah, the motion I would put forward would be that uh, council direct administration to uh, complete additional stakeholder engagement in Beaumont, uh, targeting businesses and residents, um, perhaps with a uh, further open house and consider a survey. And I'd like to add, I'd like I'd like to add in the to explore the building. explore the and to explore the uh, the building code uh, comments that were just brought forward. Is that clear enough? One sec. <laughs> you get all that, Shalane? <laughs> My motions are always the funnest. Uh, oh, they're great. <laughs> <laughs> the intent is to, to summarize is we'd like further consultation and to explore that issue. Oh, certainly. Um, Ms. Winter. Thank you, Richard. Through you to Councillor Van Newkirk. I, sorry, I just want to clarify that you want to send it back to administration for further public consultation and then targeting and explore the building code of Thank you. CEO. Just so we don't have uh, conflicting expectations, did you want to put a timeline on that? A quarter three, quarter four, next uh, week type of thing? Does it will impact other stuff? And, and that's that's fine. I, I did hear one of the councillor Moncos Swain, I believe, you know, suggest there is no rush and uh, we, we agree. Uh, but what does that mean to council? So if you want what to put some parameters on that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to turn the question back around on you because I know that we're we're doing eight master plans and other things and really, really busy. Um, what would be a reasonable time frame Mr. taking Hills. into consideration the current workload ongoing in Mr. Hills' department? We're suggesting the fall. Mr. Fall? Go ahead. Is that a reasonable timeline if we can get it done by the fall and then or earlier if they can squeeze it in? Yeah, the conversation proceeds and I think... That's a great amount of time. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Barnhart, question? Well, it, thank you, Your Worship. It was on that very topic because I, I, I don't know that we're going to get much more. It sounds like people maybe have made up their minds how they feel about it. I'm not sure that the consultation is going to bring in a lot more, but I agree more education is needed. I don't, I don't disagree. Myself, I'm getting confused on the number of different bylaws and what's provincial, what's ours, what's, you know. So it, if you can make it clearer what the changes are, I think we'd, we'd, we'd be able to get more people engaged and then we can see what their feelings are that because to take the bylaw out in its entirety, which of course we have to have it ready for people to see, but unless we really zero in on what, what are the significant changes and what's, why are we doing it, I, I don't think we're going to get many responses that are going to make much sense. So the people that have made up their mind may not even know what they've made their mind up about. It's what they think they know. Right. So it, it's not clear as a lot of information. So I definitely support it going back. I just would want to put some parameters around how that consultation goes, and I, I know you, you're up to that, so Thank my you. point. Councilor Danluck. Thank you, Your Worship. Just to speak in favor of the motion, and I appreciate uh, being brought forward by my colleague. Uh, I'm looking back on it, historically speaking, I think it's, it's prudent for us to mirror the same public consultation of the cannabis with smoking. If they had two open houses for cannabis, we should have two for smoking. The cannabis survey, we should have a cannabis, we should have a smoking survey as well. Um, looking back on things, I should have maybe thought of that when we talked about this a while ago, but it never occurred to me to be, I think it, it proves to be uh, consistent with both, with both venues in terms of public consultation. So then we can sit back and say, well, both issues were treated the same way, two surveys, two open houses for each, or a survey for each, two open houses. Then we can say proudly that we did the same amount of consultation on both topics and we came to a decision accordingly. So I support the motion. Thank you. Concluding comments, Councillor Van Newkirk. Thank you. I think uh, just to conclude, I think the I think the most surprising piece for residents would be the fact that uh, the general provisions outlined in 4.1 were in a campground, on a patio, at a playground, in an open space, in a park, at a seasonal rink, at a skate park, at a sports field, or any trails within the city. So I think that piece uh, would be the surprising part of the of the bylaw update for 
uh, residents, and uh, I think it would be important to highlight that in our and uh, our communication. I do know uh, when I attended that there was the uh, the spreadsheet of uh, the res the you know all the places where you can uh, define the public spaces versus uh, you know some of the towns and cities. So just I think really highlighting that will be the important piece moving forward. So we're I really want to limit the sur surprises to our residents. Uh, you know in this in this piece here. So thank you. All right, seeing no further discussion, all in favor of deferral. That carries unanimously. Okay. Right. Thank you. Which brings us to bylaw 948-19, subdivision and development to Peel Board, second and third reading. Is somebody from administration gonna come speak? Ms. Winter. Thank you, Worship, through you to members of council and the public. The purpose of this RFD is to present council bylaw 948-19, a bylaw to repeal bylaw 854-15 and establish a new subdivision appeal board bylaw. Council gave first reading at the February 26th regular council meeting, notable amendments, were changes to town versus city reference, reference of the Municipal Planning Commission taking out of the bylaw, adding clarification to eligibility, uh, referencing the Municipal Government Act, uh, changing any references within the Municipal Government Act, adding parameters around tying votes, um, sections under mandatory training requirements, um, added sections in fees and charges in accordance to the Beaumont fees and charges bylaw and parameters around requests for adjournments. Administration support second and third reading this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there a member of council prepared to move second reading? Councilor Barnhart. So moved, Your Worship. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? That carries unanimously. Is there a member of council willing to move third reading? Councilor Danlock. So move, Your Worship. Thank you. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? That carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Ms. Winter. Appreciate it. Uh, which brings us to item 9C, bylaw 94-19, 2019 supplementary assessment. First reading, Mr. Harris. Through you, uh, through your worship to council and the audience. Uh, before you is the recommendation from administration that council give first reading to bylaw 94019 to allow for the collection of supplementary assessments in 2019. Uh, the city or the town has been doing this since 2002. Um, it, in 2018, uh, $123,873 uh, $123, was collected through supplemental taxes and is reflected in the budget. Thank you very much. Do I have a member of council premier to rue first reading? Councillor Stout? So moved, Your Worship. Questions for administration? Councillor Van Newkirk? Uh, Sorry, I cut Councillor Stout off. Give me one okay, second. Go ahead. Councillor Stout. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just quickly, I'm reading through um, the presentation. Um, so if we don't do, if we don't pass this by May the 1st, then if I'm, if I'm reading this correctly, then the effect is that all new improvements constructed and completed in 2019 will not be taxed until 2020. Um, and so we miss out on, all, on the increase in taxable value of all those improvements for the remainder of the year. Is that correct? To your worship, to councillor Stout, or as a council, that is correct. Thank you. Sorry, councillor Van Newkirk. Yeah, through your worship to the presenter, uh, thanks for the presentation. Just a quick uh, question on the timing. It says uh, administration will continue mailing the notices out by October 31st. Um, does that typically happen throughout the period between now and October 31st? Or they all go out in October or are they all mostly out? Maybe just a comment on that. Uh, through your worship to Councillor uh, Van Newkirk. Uh, it, they get mailed out in October. So we get a report in October uh, and it gets mailed out and then they have 
uh, a certain time limit to pay within. Okay, thank okay. you. Councilor Danlock. Thank you, Worship. Just a quick question, Mr. Harris. Um, I do recall a budget workshop, a rather thick binder we had gone through, and you mentioned that the 123,000 in change is in the 2018 budget. Could you explain how that works exactly? So when we do collect these supplemental revenues from improvements on property, does that money go into our reserve or goes into our operating budget or where does the money actually go? To if you could please. To your worship, to Councillor Danlock and the rest of the council. It, it's already included in the budget. So it's in the normal operations. So it covers normal operations. So it's anticipated that in, in the twenty nineteen operating budget? Yes. 123,000 from last year? A proc I believe it's 120,000 ish. We round, yeah, round okay. okay, so it's bought, it's bought on a carry forward basis? Uh, yeah, it's, we have okay. budgeted for it over the last, uh, I think, since 2002. Okay, thank you. Further questions or discussion on the motion? All in favor of first reading? That carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Mr. Harris. This brings us to councillor inquiries. Does, do members of council have any questions for administration this evening? Councillor Van Newkirk. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have two questions tonight. Um, first question uh, for uh, administration. Uh, recently, we've seen our neighbours in the city of Leduc look to streamline their permit approval processes, offering up a 14-day approval and a fast-track uh, three-day option on the residential permits. Um, what work does Beaumont have to do uh, in order to be able to meet similar timelines in order to remain competitive in the region? Ms. Raymond. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Van Newkirk. Uh, we looked into what the City of Leduc does. Currently, their expedited permit process is run entirely on overtime. That's what their fees and charges pays for. So they have an additional development officer and um, some intake people that are able to accommodate that. We would be able to accommodate that within our current service levels in the 2019 season, given the current economic climate and the downturn in the land development industry. We do have capacity to be able to trial that. Uh, with this current resources that we have available and then evaluate what impacts that would have for next year going forward. Cool. So follow-up question. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, yeah you bet. Thank you for the response. I'm glad to hear that. Um, I think, as I said, in order to remain competitive in the region, I think we got to try the same thing. So I'm happy to hear that um, you know, no additional resources would be needed right now, I think I heard, um, in order to do that. So it would be a good testing period for that to come through. And thank you for that. So. Do do you need something from us to start that process, or can we just do it? Uh, no, no, it, nothing further is required at this point uh, for us to be able to move forward with that. We would be able to examine that and then be able to launch that for the 2019 construction season. All right, we look forward to the. To the <laughs> oh. Sorry, we would have to make amendments to our She wants money. Okay, we can do that. That's a stickler for you. Just money. But you don't need a motion from us. Well, what I was more getting at was you don't need a motion from us to start the pilot project. Yeah. You can just do it without a motion. Or <laughs> fees and charges would need to be approved by council, yeah. though the amendment. But the pilot project is going to proceed. Okay. Thank you. Further okay. questions. Uh, second question. A uh, different subject. Um, Today, a lot of it melted, but I do have a question around snow. Um, in the recent budget, uh, Council did approve increases to service levels, and I've seen it around town, and residents did too. i uh, just wondering if administration can provide an update on the status of the snow clearing in Beaumont, and uh, maybe just speak to some of the service level increases that were approved and how they were impl implemented. Um, you know, we've seen snow plowing where it hadn't been seen before. We've seen some snow removal where it hadn't been seen before. Um, called a sack snow removal, and um, I saw them all as very positive. And I just wanted to get some feedback from administration on on how that went, and uh, were there any hiccups uh, or major concerns from residents? And just a little bit of a conversation on that, please. And thank you. To you, sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Van Newkirk, uh, through your worship. When I uh, asked this question of staff and uh, 
and I appreciate the heads up on the question. It, it really helps us gather our thoughts. Uh, one of the highlighted responses I, I got was we have met the service levels for every event. I don't think I've ever been able to say that in, in my career, uh, so I'm pretty proud of that. If you recall, the uh, significant changes uh, that uh, Council uh, approved in the budget were to, uh, for one, was uh, trail clearing within 24 hours. Uh, so we hired some extra staff so that we were uh, available on the weekend, and that was uh, absorbed in the budget. The other was a significant uh, change in our residential snow removal, and that was to get into the cul-de-sacs up to two times per year, depending on the snow event. Uh, we're happy to report we were able to get into every cul-de-sac this year, and we did get people phoning us saying they've never seen a grader in the cul-de-sac before or a loader, um, so that, that was positive. Mm -hmm. We started tracking uh, the other changes that were made. There were some priorities uh, uh, on some of the streets that we had as a P2 and we made uh, change them to P1 wasn't a significant one, but that was on the, uh, the snow clearing maps that we looked at at budget time. We started tracking, uh, it's called a snow and ice control um, data that tracks um, total roadway ice control hours, plowing hours, snow removal hours, and trail and sidewalk plowing hours. So I have that data, but we just started tracking it. So it's really a benchmark. Um, and no, I'm not giving it to you, Mark. Unless Councillor Stout, so you can make a graph out of it. <laughs> no, I will, because it's kind of interesting. It, it doesn't mean anything to me, and, and I've been in this business for a while, but it, 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 this must be new measuring technology. Um, but for uh, for the sake total uh, road ice control hours, it's 138. That's uh, mainly sanding and and, uh, and salt. Uh, plow, road plowing hours was 568. Uh, snow removal hours, so we're actually picking up the windrows and taking them out, is 103. And then total trail and sidewalk snow plowing hours was 283. Some lessons learned this year. Um, we did see, receive some complaints when we did some windrowing. Uh, we had a lot of questions from people in the cul-de-sacs, what are you going to do with that mountain of snow? Um, thankfully, we had their kids then call us and say, don't take away that mountain of snow because um, they had a ball. Uh, so what we're going to do now is it's obviously it's it's going to uh, to melt, but we're we're getting in there when we can and and loading it out. Uh, so we don't end up with big pools of water. We've got some low areas in this community. I'm guessing that this spring we're going to learn that we probably should have got into some of those areas quicker than others, uh, but that's part of the learning. Also, with some of the windrowing, we did get some complaints from, uh, from people around their driveways. We have a gate on our... Um, on our uh, grader that helps clear those and sometimes that's more of an art form than a science and, and we don't get it uh, nailed down and uh, uh, infrastructure is looking at the routes that they travel uh, whether they're traveling across town to hit two p1s or can they, get, can they hit a p2 on the way so those types of things um, they're analyzing this year but but overall um, it was uh, in my opinion a very successful uh, implementation of of a year that we received quite a bit of snow so, uh, you know, kudos to council for uh, uh, challenging and uh, setting those uh, service levels and uh, also uh, thanks to the administrative, the infrastructure folks for, uh, for pulling it together. They really rally around this stuff. They love it because mm -hmm. it's an instant gratification. So if you say make it better, they just let's go. We'll make it better. Other notable note, approval in 2019 budget is for a third grader. So come next year, we will have a third grader. Mm -hmm. so I hope that answers your question. Probably a little longer yeah. than you were looking for. <laughs> no, that's good. Yeah, no, it's uh, one of the things that uh, that we do in scouting is plan, do, review, and so this is part of the the review side of things that I think is important. Is to just you know we 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 look to improve service levels. Uh, we acted upon it, and then you know let's reflect on it. And I think it's important to um, reflect on some of the lessons learned as much as the good things that we got from it, because we'll continually improve. And thank you for the update on that. Further questions from members of council? All right, seeing none, CAO updates. All right, I'm gonna send a record for speaking in one evening. A uh, couple quick things, um, small matter of an MDP that went through the ref process at exactly four o'clock on March 8th, well done. That, that was, was a great, sorry. That was a long time coming. That was a big. That was a long time coming. Had a lot of uh, hands on to uh, to make that come through from administration, from council. A lot of work done in the region. I mean, and the yes, that's right. Open house tomorrow night. Where's that at? The open house tomorrow night is at the Ken Nickel. There we go. Open house at the Ken Nickel. You see the new brand out on the on the uh, signs as well. Very exciting. Now, next steps are a second and third reading, which I believe are scheduled for the first part of April, depending on the open house, or is it? Next council meeting. Next council meeting. That's even more exciting. They don't tell me anything. <laughs> um, 
One other thing, uh, today we uh, had a media release went out uh, about the city of Beaumont receiving $164,800 uh, from the Alberta Community Transit Fund. Uh, we will receive that money to help boost our, if you recall, we came to council and talked about the possibility of smart fare. Uh, we also talked, there's, we're also involved in some smart bus technology as part of a regional effort. And uh, I'm just going to read a, a quote here that, that was part of the media release is that the city of Beaumont smart fare and smart bus technology project was selected on the level of regional collaboration that went into developing the, the, the project um, and its environmental, social, and economic benefits. So that's just an example of the rewards uh, as we increase our efforts in that regional collaboration. So that, that's pretty exciting. If I recall um, a year ago or, or several months ago when we in, we asked council if they even wanted us to pursue the smart fare. I think the ticket was $150,000 or something at that point in time. So this helps offset some of that. Where this can be all spent? Not entirely certain, but it'll go towards those two uh, two efforts. Um, one other quick one is our 2019 census will be starting on May 1st with a schedule to wrap up on June 5th. Um, the final report will come to council on uh, June 25th. The process we're using this year, we're using a bit of a hybrid approach, uh, which means we're going to have an ex a period of time where people can, residents can complete the census questionnaire online. Uh, then we will send out enumerators to pick up the ones that we haven't been able to get. Um, there's some real economics in that and some convenience for the, uh, for the uh, households as well. Uh, typically, we, have, we plan to hire 15 enumerators uh, to carry out the census. Uh, I, I got to tell you that Ms. Winter, when she gets behind this thing, is, is like a pit bull. Um, and there's a reason. Uh, for every person that we are able to count, every increase is worth about $257 per resident in provincial and, and federal grant funding. So it's, it's a, a lucrative effort. And the only way to get that number to increase is to get everybody. So I urge the residents out there, please, if, uh, somebody knocking on your door, it's an enumerator, please, it takes a couple minutes and uh, it really helps us out as a community. Um, for which one though? I'm not sure. I'm not sure for this. Oh, okay, okay. I want to clear that because I'll be too confused. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, really appreciate it. I got you set. There's no correspondence. Notices of motion. Councillor Van Newkirk. Hello, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, one notice of motion to put in tonight. Um, the council direct administration to remove uh, 2D questions or presentations will not be accepted on agenda items before council at that same meeting. Comes from section 14, uh, present labeled presentations from bylaw 923-18, uh, the meeting procedures bylaw. Thank you. Thank you very much. We accept your notice of motion. There being no items for a closed session, we're adjourned. 8.30 p.m. Thank you very much.